I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Thank you everyone for coming in attendance tonight. Uh, we begin with 3.01, the Pledge of Allegiance. Tonight we have Keely Rochard from Warhill High School to come lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, may I please stand? Yeah, we changed our flag. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Keely. I appreciate that. We were used to the flag being over here, and they changed the flag on us, so we had to adjust there real quickly. Uh, next, next item on the agenda is the roll. Ms. Urza? Dr. Beers? Dr. Beers? Oh, here. <laughs> Here. 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 Thank you. Uh, certification of closed session. Dr. Beers, can I get a motion for certification of closed session, please? I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters, lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements, as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Erza? Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Minor? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye, thank you. Next item on the agenda, 4.01. Ms. Selma, can I get a motion for approval of the agenda, please? I move that we approve the agenda. As presented? As presented. <clears throat> You're putting me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is there, <laughs> sec is there a second? Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Ms. Erza? Ms. Minor? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. 5.01, Announcements Superintendent's Report. Dr. Heron? Good evening, Mr. Chair. I'd like to start my announcements by congratulating every WJCC school for earning full state accreditation. The state released their ratings last week, and WJCC is one of only 53 school divisions in Virginia where all schools are accredited. There are 132 school divisions in Virginia. We are planning a presentation on SOL achievement in October and we'll provide you with additional details then. The fourth annual manufacturing day is set for October 7th. Participating students and staff will visit companies such as Anheuser-Busch, Ball Corporation, Core 6 Precision, Precision Glass, Owens, Illinois, Print Pack Inclusive, and the Walmart Distribution Center. I'd like to publicly thank these businesses for providing students with an opportunity to learn about careers in manufacturing. I hope board members can join us for at least a portion of the day. The Greater Williamsburg Distance Running Club in coordination with the School Health Initiative Program, or SHIP, and Jamestown Cross Country Team will be hosting a one mile and a two mile challenge run slash walk for elementary and middle school students, runners on Saturday, October 22nd. They will be held at the Green Springs, Springs Interpretive Trail and on the grounds of Jamestown High School. The race is free for athletes and four races will be run, organized according to age, with the first race starting at 8.30 a.m. For more information or to sign up, follow the link on wjccschools.org. And finally, the Virginia Department of Education has awarded WJCC $54,432 from the 2016 School Security Equipment Grant Program. WJCC will use the grant funds to, pur to purchase additional security cameras at DJ Montague Elementary and Clara Bird Baker Elementary. This is the fourth time WJCC has earned a security equipment grant from the state. Previously, funds were used for access control systems and security camera upgrades. Mr. Chair, those are all of the announcements I have for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Are there any announcements from board members this evening? Mrs. Hummel. 
Hi, I would like uh, everyone to just know about all of our teachers, to know about the WJCC Schools Foundation Grant Workshops that are coming up. We have one on Tuesday, uh, September 27th, uh, and then Wednesday, October 5th. Both of those are going to be at the school board's um, office, but that, uh, the extent, what is it, building 300? the building 300. Uh, the one next Tuesday is going to be at 4 o'clock and the one <clears throat> on Wednesday, October 5th is going to be at 5 o'clock. All the information about the grants for the teachers is on the WJCC Education Foundation's website. You can just Google that and uh, you can also go to that website by going to our uh, WJCC uh, website and then looking under community and finding the community uh, foundation. I would encourage all of our teachers. Last year we had 25 grant applications uh, and we're anticipating doubling that this year. So please, um, uh, we're looking forward to any kind of innovative ideas that you may have because the community has given a lot of money to fund those grants. Great, thank you. It's, uh, the uh, foundation does great work, and the teachers do great work with those with those grant money, that grant money that comes out. So it's good. Any other board member announcements this evening? Takes us to 6.01 board recognitions. Good evening, Mr. Chair. We have several recognitions this evening. We begin by recognizing Warhill's Lady Lions for being named WHSL's Conference 3A Softball Champions. Great job, ladies. This is Warhill's third state championship since the school's opening. And I'd like to invite uh, head coach of the Lady Lions, Thomas Bunn, to come up and introduce the team. Thank you. All right, just introducing the players. Um, Matt Maddie Bradshaw. <laughs> Sammy Crittenden. Maggie Curran. <laughs> Lindsay Davis. Recognizing one of our graduated seniors who couldn't make it tonight, Michaela Fannin. Her sister Tyra Fannin, who's not here as well. Okay. <laughs> Kara McClure, and also a member of the All Kristen Morris Rose. Jasmine Ortiz. Ashton Odie. Another player who's unavailable, but Catherine Pirin. <laughs> Madison Richardson. <laughs> Highlighted, I think I'm supposed to read this, read this part too. Uh, Conference 25 Player of the Year and also uh, all. Uh, the State Player of the Year, Keely Richard. <laughs> Another one of our graduated seniors who couldn't make it, Haley Schultz. Also unavailable, her sister, Olivia, who was also a member of the All-State team. 
Anna Tufte. And uh, the last player is Jewel Walters, who's unavailable because she's at her volleyball game tonight. <laughs> and before we do the final photograph, we do have one more recognition tonight. Uh, Thomas Bond, head coach of Lady Lions, was named the VHSL's 2016 Conference 25 Coach of the Year. Congratulations. <laughs> And also, if I could announce, our, also our assistant coach is also here, Ken Mackins. The Association of School Business Officials International has awarded WJCC's Finance Department its Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2015. This is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting. In addition, the Government Finance Association of the United States and Canada also recognized the Finance Department for their comprehensive annual financial report. On behalf of the department, I would like to ask Christina Berta and Renee Ewing to come up front to be recognized for these outstanding accomplishments. Congratulations again, Finance Department. <laughs> Matoka Elementary and the Matoka Elementary PTA have been recognized as the 2016 through 18 National PTA School of Excellence for their achievement in building effective family school partnerships. This designation is awarded when a PTA and school have achieved a high level of family engagement or when a PTA and the school have made positive improvement in families' perceptions by the end of the school year. Principal Andy Jacobs, former PTA president Catherine Clarenbach, and other PTA team leaders, please join us up front to be recognized. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations to the entire Matoka community. Lafayette High School and their PTA also received this distinction and we will be recognized at a future meeting. We continue with another WJCC department recognition. The Public Relations and Engagement Department has also earned national recognition. The National School Public Relations Association awarded the PR department two Golden Chief Achievement Awards one for the 10 points of pride card and one for communications about the 2016 presidential dual primary. In addition, the department achieved two honorable mention awards, one for a branding package for the WJCC Schools Foundation and one for the video production of Good to Talk. I'd like to ask Betsy Overcamp-Smith and Ronnie Showa to join us up front to be recognized.
Chair, that concludes recognitions for this evening. We will have more recognitions at the regular October meeting next in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. That takes us to 7.01, citizens' comments. Dr. Beers? It is at <clears throat> this point in our meeting where citizens are invited to address the school board. Those citizens desiring to speak have submitted speaker cards to the clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. When a speaker's name is called, the speaker comes to the podium and states his or her name for the record and directs his or her comments to the chair of the board. In order to promote a listening and respectful environment, please avoid applauding, verbal outpours, or any other type of demonstration when the speaker is addressing the school board. Personal matters are not considered in public meetings. The school board requests that all speakers refrain from making any reference to specific individuals in any form or fashion. The school board's role is to listen to the speaker rather than to respond to his or her comments. Each speaker is all allocated three minutes to make his or her comments. The school board asks each speaker to respect this time limitation. Time may not be yielded to another speaker your acceptance and adherence to these <coughs> guidelines will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Beers. I believe we have more than 10 cards tonight. We have 11 speakers. We have 11 tonight. cards. So yeah. if the if the board would uh, just let, send that to 33 possible minutes versus 30, we'll uh, give everybody their, their three minutes. So uh, with that, Mrs. Cook. Yes, uh, Philip Kennedy. <coughs> what? Oh, he does. Oh, okay. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to address some issues. It's nice to hear that we're getting security equipment grants. Considering Lafayette High School has had a 395% increase in disorderly or disruptive behaviors for the most recent data that was reported to the state. In addition to that, they've had a 327% increase in all other offenses at Lafayette High School. War Hill High School has had an 83% increase in disorderly and disruptive behavior offenses and a 68% increase in alcohol, tobacco, and drug and other offenses. James River Elementary School and DJ Montague, those two elementary schools have more disorderly and disruptive behavior offenses than our seven other elementary schools combined. Clearly, there is a problem with leadership at these schools. Um, if we are reporting this kind of data and having this type of issues at these schools where we have other schools in Williamsburg, James City County that has zero offenses in these categories. Um, in closing, I'd just like to say we need to address these issues. It's wonderful that we talk about the SOL scores and all the other great things that we have here, but no school district can be great if they're ignoring the issues that exist within our community. And to quote Mr. Kelly, Kelly, we aren't looking to make them equal, but to raise the lower level. Mr. Kennedy, is your email address correct on this? Yes, Okay, because I sent you an email lap to the last meeting in hopes to talk to you about that, but uh, never received a reply, so. Correct, because you confirmed what I just quoted. You, in your email, you said I, what you quoted was correct. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Okay. Adrian Carter, please. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. I am Adrienne Carter. I live at 100 Lauren Court in Jamestown District. And I'm a native of James City County. I was educated right here in the Williamsburg James City County School District. I started school in the early days of school integration and entered Rawlsburg Elementary School in the 1970-71 school year. I graduated from Lafayette High School in 1982. Back then, there was but one public high school in the Williamsburg James City County public school system. Um, back then, there was one high school, one middle school, and there were three elementary schools back then. And correct me if I'm wrong, today we have three high schools, three middle schools, and a dire need for one more middle school in the, in the school district. I don't have the statistics about what the 
uh, ratio regarding African American teachers were during the 70s. Um, but um, I don't have the statistics regarding, the, regarding those ratios and other minority teachers. But the social science project that we know is integration did allow for African American teachers to migrate into the integrated school systems. As a result, both African American students and Caucasian students in this district during that time were given or afforded the, the experience and the exposure of benefiting from the cultural competencies of both groups. I'm here this evening to briefly address um, Maybe I'm in, to briefly address the three, three specific issues of concerns for which I, as a former student and a current parent of a child in this school system, that I deem is necessary. Number one, the absence of sufficient representation of African American and other minorities, representation of professional educators in the classroom throughout the entire school district. I'm sure you've heard this argument more than once. Secondly, I'd like to provide recommendations to provide a resource to close the achievement gap in our school district. And thirdly, uh, the need for a in-district or an independent vocational education trade program with a district migration away from the regional VOTEC program that we currently support, known as New Horizons. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. So firstly, regarding the district's failure to recruit, hire, and support African American and Latino professional educators specifically, I ponder if anyone in the listening public viewing the proceeding from their home has ever wondered aloud or privately why so few minorities are working as professional educators in our schools? Mrs. Carter, is your, is your three minute time up? No, is it? Oh, okay, well let me just go to my last little point then. My point is uh, about, my point is that um, in closing, it's our responsibility to educate our children. Historically speaking, historically speaking, most of us arrived on a boat, and 400 years later, we're, pop, we're still in the same boat. If, if you could make sure that Mrs. Serza gets your copy of your comments, and she can get those to the board. Your full, all, all of your comments. Oh, you want all of it? If, Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> Beth Hall, please. Good evening. Good evening. I've been a regular attendee of these school board meetings that span 20 years. I've been advocating for students and teachers and schools that struggle to be heard. Students of color, economically disadvantaged, and students with disabilities. Sadly, I've seen little improvement to lessen the disparity of these groups and schools. I come before you tonight with a heavy heart knowing that if you are a black student, economically disadvantaged, or a student with a disability, recent statistics show that you are only 50, you have 50, 50 chance of passing your SOLs in almost all areas of study. Students with disabilities take the biggest hit, and if you fall under the multiple categories as well, your chances are less. The differences between our white peers is striking. If a student is not reading at grade level, they will continue to fall farther and farther behind. It is not surprising that these students are not prepared to take higher level courses in high school, which makes the prospect of college out of reach. We are not preparing our students to realize their full potential. We had some great programs over the years that helped improve outcomes of these students. A successful program like STEP, which was a year-long career preparation course, which was offered at Jamestown 
for Jamestown students and the Academy for Life and Learning to help academically struggling students, to name just two, and there were others. But sadly, they ended up being discarded because they came with a cost. But the track records of these programs show great outcomes for these at-risk students and the cost, well, we pay now or we pay later. Shouldn't all students have the same opportunities to succeed, even if you are different? A community's investment in their children builds strong and productive citizens and a great workforce. Please put this topic of disparity on your agenda for discussion. Thank you. Kim Hunley, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mrs. L. Sorry. Kim Hunley, please. Sorry, didn't mean to get ahead of you. It's low. It's low on the uptake. Good evening, how are you? Good evening. Welcome back to the school year. Um, I have two cards in. I only meant to put in one, but um, someone on my exec board put in one because I wasn't here. So um, first card, I'm going to introduce the exec board because I know we're going to be working really closely with you this year, and I know we're already um, going to be having meetings with Dr. Heron. So um, Jerry Farrell is my vice president. <laughs> And Amelie Drake was president last year, and now she is going to be our um, secretary. And then our treasurer is Heather. Heather's the, we're never going to let her go as treasurer. <laughs> and then I have some um, members at large, but two are not here. Deb Ogburn and um, Karen Armstead had car trouble. She called me. And then I have Toisha Johnson. So I wanted to introduce you all to them so you have a face. So that's my first card. Second card, I was here to talk about the water. And um, so my husband said, I, are you talking to the Board of Supervisors or the school board? And I said, no, it is a school board. Um, but what I was thinking about, and it's kind of like what I'm hearing echo through some of the conversations, um, I was watching on the internet, I don't know if you've seen it, like different people are checking the pH level of of all the waters and this one gentleman had like 20 waters out and he's and water that I've been drinking thinking it was all that finding out it was crummy you know and he has the little stick and he measures it up and you want a pH balance of like nine point something to be high and and I was thinking it's just you know when you look at them in the bottles and I don't know what want to know what y'all are drinking because don't go watch because <laughs> you'll find out it's probably you know but um, <laughs> anyway I was like, but it, you think it's just water. But then you're looking at labels, like P. Daddy has this label, and his water's really high and um, you know low. It, it's just, it was incredible. So I said, well, what are the waters that are good? I couldn't find one at all in Williamsburg, and that was called Chill. That was the <laughs> one with high. You want it nine. Four. So these were the top two that I could find in Williamsburg, the Essentia and Evian or Evian, I don't know Evian. how you pronounce it. These are the ones you want to be drinking. However, then there's a concern with the bottles that they're in. You know, you really shouldn't be drinking water that is in bottles because of the chemical content. Then some waters, you know, are high in fluoride and, and things like that. So then I was thinking, you know, it's, that's what we really want for our school system is that if we lined all the schools up and we took that a stick and we put it in each of the waters, we want quality water for every school. So that's something we really need to work on. And I know that Dr. Beers was at the same, um, we went to hear um, Pedro, Pedro Noegro, and he was talking about um, inequity. And he asked a, a awesome question, like how do you work on that if you have one school that's you know low, uh, high, um, um, free and reduced lunch, and then you have another school that has n none, what you do, you know, what do you do? So that's a good question, and we'll have to think about it. This one, Fred, 13 point um, high. Look at the shape of the bottle. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, but thank you. We'll work on that equity this year. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Carter McNeese, please. My name is Carter McNeese. Um, I live at um, 4902 Helen Potts Place off of Long Hill Road. Um, Mr. Chairperson, thank you 
um, for um, having public comments. And um, Mrs. Zhang, good job on the on the ringtone. I, I was jamming out over so there. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I, I'm here today. You can see there's a, a group of us, and we all have on um, the same shirt. Um, it's a group of citizens who have gotten together um, recently to talk about some of these inequities um, that we have in our community and what we can do together, um, bringing all of them uh, together. And uh, tonight I specifically want to speak to y'all um, about something that you may have heard in the news and it's called the school to prison pipeline. Um, we recognize that our schools are sort of the first intervention step with many of our uh, students and many of our citizens. This is the first place where some of our students are are getting a chance to uh, be, come into contact with wonderful trained professionals, professional teachers, professional counselors, um, and all sorts of other things. And so we have a responsibility to make sure that our education system is wonderful. And I'm the son of two uh, public school teachers. Um, I did not grow up in James City County or in the city of Williamsburg, but I'm proud that I graduated um, from a public institution because when we have public schools, everybody is better off for it. So I'm not a, I'm not a parent but I'm here because I believe in our school system. I'm gonna share some statistics with you um, that are troubling. Now these are national statistics um, and, um, and uh, they are from an infographic that was from, um, 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 uh, Tavis Smiley did a, has done a series of reports on this system and this is an infographic that his people put together. These are, these are national statistics. 40% of students who are expelled in this country are black. 70% of in-school arrests are made our students of color. Black students are three and a half times more likely to be suspended than white students. Black and Latino students are twice as likely to not graduate nationwide. And 68% of males in state and federal prison do not have a high school diploma. We have an ongoing conversation in our country about the criminal justice system, we have an ongoing conversation in our country about inequality and inequality of outcome. Our school systems, you are a first step in addressing some of these problems. We have reams of ink, a paper has been printed on and ink spilled um, over the growing uh, amount of people in our prison system and schools are a first step in that and so I hope that we can work together to come up with some solutions so that we can disrupt this pipeline um, and so that our students um, are graduating and not ending up in jail being paid for by us. Thank you, sir. Dale Nellis. Hi, my name is Dale Nellis. I'm here to address, I have two sons that play baseball at Jamestown High School. Last year we had a, an issue that I'm here to address first and foremost is after a baseball game, I got a phone call from my children. I have two sons and they said, Dad, we don't have a ride home. I said, what do you mean you don't have a ride home? He said, they told us when they dropped us off at the bus at the game that we don't have a bus ride back. My wife was in New Orleans. I was in Fredericksburg. And it took me an hour and a half to get back to them. They were sitting outside of Warhill High School. Thank God one of the parents from Warhill that I know sat with them. No AD, no coaches, no nothing. At the military, we leave no man behind. I guess Jamestown doesn't have that motto. I brought the attention of the AD twice. I went to the principal twice. Very little satisfaction. It was like, hey, they're fine. One boy actually walked home. His father's here. Second thing I'd like to address, and I'd like somebody to explain this to me, at the beginning of the year, um, we met the coach, we met the AD, they were both brand new. We were told that the Jamestown field was in disarray, needed many repairs, we were looking for donations, we were going to do many fundraisers. First fundraiser, which we believed was February 7th, February 14th. Understand, this is pre-roster. Kids were appointed to work for youth baseball camps at Jamestown High School. We all believe it's a fundraiser for our fields, fences, whatever. Later, only to find out, it was a pocket lining by the head coach. And it, our kids were made mandatory to work. Now, I don't know about you, I can't make anybody come to my job and work for me. So I'd like someone to answer the question of why that was done and understand some kids were paid and not all kids. I have two sons. One was paid, one wasn't. I'd like an answer. That's all I'd like. Lastly, 
we had an eight-year, ten-year coach. His name was um, Mike Kubler, great guy. He was, his job was terminated. He was forced to resign. The three reasons given were his association with the Venom baseball organization, which is an outside baseball organization, his lack of a fall baseball program, and his lack of communication with the parents. This year, the coach works for the Venom baseball organization. They just ran a tournament this weekend. He has no fall baseball program, and we were not allowed to communicate with him at all. No parent was allowed to talk to him directly. He set up a liaison. Everything had to go through the parent, then to the coach. So if you email him, the parent would say, you really don't want to send this. If you did, your son was punished. No, no playing time, blah, blah, blah. And if you think I'm wrong, we had a child go to his grandfather's funeral and was benched. Thank you. It's a problem that needs addressed. Thank you, Mr. Nellis. Benched. Kirsten Nellis, please. Hi, I'm Kirsten Nellis. I'm part two. Um, just talking about the same thing, John Cole and the problems we've had with him. Um, at the beginning of the season last year, we were all told that it was mandatory to buy $180 worth of practice gear for the kids. Each child had to purchase $180 worth of gear, of which most of it wasn't used. It was all purchased from Ath Russell Athletics by the head coach's brother-in-law who sold the Russell Athletics. I think that's a direct conflict of interest. I think this coach has shown us over and over again that he is negligent and he has used his position to gain for self-gain. This summer, he sent out an email to all of the players saying, he had a hitting camp at his hitting facility, and he wanted all the Jamestown players to play, to come and hit at a charge. He would prefer to have all Jamestown players and not have to have anybody from the public. Are we to infer that if our kids didn't go to this, that they're not playing this season? Are we to figure this out? Um, We have done multiple fundraisers for this coach. He called us at the beginning of the season and said, we need cash. So each and every parent wrote a check to him. Then we had another fundraiser um, on the diamond where we were forced to, every parent had to furnish a basket for auction, for a silent auction. All of these monies have been collected. I would say that there is a Title IX issue as well going on here. Half of it's being run through the boosters. Half of it is not. Um, when we were asked for a good accounting, we've been given accounting for the uh, fundraiser, the dinner on the diamond, but not for the other funds. We've not seen any of the results of that last. We were told that it was to raise funds for a fence. There's no fence been installed. There's no plans for the fence to be installed. So I have trouble with that. Um, you know, since we went to the budget meeting, my child, both my sons, have been taken off of the baseball notification list. The other two fathers that were at that meeting, their children have also been taken off that list. There has been no others. We have talked to the AD. We have talked to the principal. The principal has sent us here. So we are now asking for your help to look into this. We have people that will testify. We have people, we have forms, we have papers, whatever you need, we would be more than happy to furnish to you. It's been a horrendous season. We cannot talk to the coach without our kids getting benched. The kids cannot talk to the coach without being told, turn in your jersey if you don't like it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mills. Frank Walls, please. Jeanette Gordon Weaver. Good evening. Good evening. It's Jeanette Gordon Weaver. Oh, no I'm way. Sorry. It's okay. My apologies. Um, not a problem. In 2004, 2005, I had the wonderful opportunity to speak before the school board at that time 
Um, unfortunately, I am back in 2016 speaking on the exact same issue, which is the minority achievement or lack thereof. Um, the gap persists, and I don't necessarily understand why it persists in double digits. In 2004, 2005, I had a lot of hope for what would occur and what would not occur in the Williamsburg James City County school system. A lot of that hope came from the then coordinator, Dr. Darian Jones, who made sure that I knew and gave me information to look up for myself and others, um, that there are ways to close the gap, to narrow the gap, and to help children of color um, minority children, children of lower socioeconomic levels to achieve at their greatest levels. It shouldn't be that way 12 years later. Um, in reading some information that was published on your website, the school board's website, minority achievement ranked next to the bottom on the bulleted list of importance. The top three concerns were all budgetary. It all had to do with finance. I know that it takes money to run things. I know you need not money to make things work. I also know that if you don't do something to step in and to help the child to be successful, a child will not succeed. There are plenty of wonderful teachers within the Williamsburg James City County school system. One of them just spoke. Kim Hunley is a wonderful teacher. Um, I know that on a personal level. I know that because my children matriculated in Williamsburg James City County Schools. I have a daughter who graduated from the United States Naval Academy. Her SOL scores were not below the state average. She's an engineer because she was educated here, but also because she had a parent who knew that she needed to be present in every aspect of her educational system. During the 2004, 2005, 2006 school year, there was a minority achievement task force. I don't know that that is happening now. I need to know that our children are as equally as important as the status of the buildings that we're putting up, as baseball fields, as new gymnasiums. I need to know that you want children of color, children of lower economic levels to succeed at their highest rate. You want to keep a child in a classroom and out of a courtroom, help them to succeed in the classroom. Thank you, Mrs. Weaver. Jacqueline Williams, please. Good evening. I'm Jacqueline Williams, founder of The Village. The Village is a group of concerned citizens, spiritual leaders, parents, and children, and educators. The Village has a clear vision, mission, and plan. Our vision, The Village, is an organization formed to promote unity and education while building a bridge between local schools, parents, and to help them get connected with tools to aid each child in reaching their full potential. <clears throat> Our mission, we will work with schools to address the achievement gap and the disproportionate percentages of expulsion and suspension of minority youth, which leads to the pipeline to prison. Our plan, our empowerment is initiative seeks to reach our youth early, giving them the support and the tools they need to build confidence and to keep them off the streets and in school. We will do this by advocating for the children and the parents, mentoring, tutoring, and by promoting educational opportunities that speak to the aptitude of all students. We seek to empower our students. Our goal is to unite as one community to save lives. <clears throat> we meet every Monday from 6 to 8, and all are welcome to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Williams? Ms. Williams? Where do you meet? We, um, we have several locations. Okay. Um, we meet at New Zion Baptist Church, First Baptist Church, and we meet at the Griffin Yates Building in York County. This week we will be at the Angle Restaurant. Um, we're having a big party. <laughs> but, um, you are all welcome to attend and we can afford Please. Please. Thank you. Kathy Willem, please. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. My name is Kathy Willem. I reside at 121 Tayside, and I serve as president of the Lafayette High School Athletic Boosters. First, I am here to say thank you 
to Alan Robertson and Marcella Snipes. They have been wonderful collaborators and supportive in the process of the Lafayette High School Auxiliary Gym design team, and we truly appreciate it. Uh, they've been receptive to ideas and open, state, and open dialogue, uh, and it's been truly a positive process. We've had productive discussions with key stakeholder input to conscientiously consider the most appropriate design to meet the needs of Lafayette students, the need to stay within the construction budget, and the greater needs of Williamsburg, James City County overall, uh, namely Parks and Rec. So all of those three things were openly discussed. What I would like to do tonight is ask this board to also keep in mind the topics, the other topics that came before you all last year. And they include uh, several things, for example, the need for theater storage and safety improvements at the WISC uh, fields that we use for our baseball team. We truly feel that those problems, those issues can be solved by similarly productive dialogue as we saw with the, the gym discussion. There were two other long-standing needs for the athletic facility improvements that the school board voted into the CIP last year. Lights on the few fields that we have at Lafayette High School and a walkway to WISC where our student athletes ask, access the fields um, there because we do not have the, the space uh, on campus. Of particular interest we've been seeing lately is the increased community interest, especially for the walkway. Um, it continues to grow, and I'm happy to share with you tonight that at the last Booster Club meeting, Lisa Hatcher was named chairperson of this endeavor. And her role will be to work with all of the interested parties and really serve as a connector between the parents, the citizens, the schools, uh, and the county to really come together and think about options that are safe, that are cost effective, and they do not have to come with that price tag that was talked about last year that had grown tenfold. Um, so we're really looking forward to ongoing productive dialogue. And as always, thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bull. Frank Walls. Oh, come on. OK. Is that all the uh, public comment we have? Yes, sir. Great. That moves us to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion for approval of the consent agenda? 8.01, approval of minutes from the following meetings, 816 and 9616. 8.02, financial report and monthly bills and payroll, August 2016. 8.03, personnel actions as, a, as, as uh, presented tonight. 8.04, Resolution R1216, National Disability and Awareness Month, it's October. 8.05, R1316, Bullying Prevention Month, October. 8.06, Authorization to Permit City County Use of School Buses. 8.07, Revise, Recode, and Rename Policy AFD, Educational Support Evaluation to Policy GDN, Evaluation of Support Staff, 8.08, .08, Revise, Recode, and Rename Policy AFC, Evaluation of Teachers to Policy GCN, Evaluation of Professional Staff, and finally, 8.09, Revise, Recode, and Rename Policy BHBA, School Board Conferences, Conventions, Workshops, and Memberships to BHB School Board Member In-Service Activities. Can I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move the consent agenda as presented. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Ms. Serza? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Minor? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to action item 9.01. Can I get a motion for a financial report and year-end spending plan June 2016? Mr. Chair, I move approval of financial report and year on spending plan for the year ended June 30, 2016. Thank you, Mrs. Cook. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Minor. Um, I'll let Ms. Burdick come up and say, first of all, thank you for your patience with me. Um, and congratulations to you and your department. I am confident and assured 
uh, about the way that you all handle um, the funds of the taxpayers and the citizens. And as you know, that we had a lot of questions about the fund balance as I attended strategic planning meetings and emails and others. So you provided a report to, to us today. So if we could just sort of go through that in a compressed way, it might be helpful for folks to understand how we make choices on what to do with the end of your balance. Sure. Um, <coughs> as required by state code, we cannot carry over a fund balance. Um, and the, the county and city contract allows for us to request through a year in spending plan the use of those funds. Otherwise, those funds would need to be returned to both the city and the county. Um, it's fiscally conservative budgeting to have leftover funds. We don't want to be pushed to the max where we're pinching pennies. Um, that's definitely not financially conservative, nor is it best practice. practice. So the $3.4 million, while that sounds like a large number, that is 2.7% of our overall budget. We did um, tighten spend down on that budget because we knew we had to fund the Lafayette High School project and wanted to ensure that we had the ample funding there to provide that million dollars to support that project. The fund balance is derived from um, mainly the savings in fuel, the savings in utility, we have done a three-year analysis on that budget for the fiscal year 17 budget and have reduced those budgets by $250,000 and $25,000 respectively based on that three-year trend. Based on the volatility in the market, it's not favorable to reduce that any further. Um, that again would not be fiscally conservative. Attrition is derived across all cost centers, all functions of our organization. It is not just teachers. That is the natural course of business um, every year as employees retire or choose to leave and they're replaced by new employee entry-level employees that have different salary and benefits. Um, the band uniform request, our band uniforms are between 9 and 11 years old based on the three high schools. We are proposing $40,000 for each high school's band uniform replacements for a total of $120,000. And if they exceed that amount, then they would need to find another way to fund that through their own school activity funds. The million five recommendation for the Lafayette Auxiliary Gym was proposed before the design committee completed their work. We do know that we are under budget based on that design committee's work. While under budget, small under budget, I mean like $700 under budget, still under budget. And that does include some contingency. However, administration's recommendation is that we still remain with the $500,000 contingency for those unknown variables that may arise. That is the board discretion. If you wish to change that, you certainly can. The auxiliary gym value engineering and construction management was reevaluated. We have allowed for a new estimate of $20,000 for value engineering, $150,000 for construction management. That is why that was modified to $170,000. And we did increase the bus school bus replacement to eight instead of six in your last plan for a total cost of $870,000. We do have 10 replacement buses that are needed based on age in the replacement cycle this year. We did choose during the operating budget process to not include those in the budget in an effort to provide the salary increase to our staff. Um, there is a list of those bus replacements in your packet that show you that all of those buses currently are above 235,000 miles. They are at the 15 year age mark. So that's why we're recommending eight. Um, and that also is attributed to the fact that the governor recently announced difficulty in revenue projections for the upcoming year. We want to be fiscal stewards and try to offset some of what we think is going to happen with state funding since that represents about 24% of our budget. Additionally, we know the projected increase for VRS for all of our professional employees is projected to go up by 1.83 percent. So that's a pretty big chunk to have to fund. So that is why we are recommending the adjustment to eight buses. That would still allow a return to the city and county of $788,549. And now we know why you won the awards. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay. Dr. Beers? Yeah, I, I guess um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, and I guess the first one is um, I know, uh, you know, after uh, when you reach June 30, 
The only thing is if whatever money you have left over uh, can be for capital projects. I, I understand that. What I don't understand is, or, or, or uh, maybe you know, I need a little more explanation here, is we're returning to the county almost $800,000. And what I'm wondering is um, if that money had been um, identified earlier before June 30, but also um, at a time when it might have been used in other areas um, um, that were not capital projects, um, is that uh, possible? Or is that something that might be considered in the future in terms of um, when it occurs? Um, you know, I suppose if I looked at every single monthly statement, I could keep track of it myself. But I think it would be helpful in the future to, um, um, and, and maybe that was done and I'm just not aware of it, to alert the superintendent or the board that it looks like um, we're going to have more of this or less of that, whatever it might be, um, because we cut things from the budget that uh, were not um, capital projects that I, I know people probably, you know, uh, you know, when you have a $127 million budget, uh, $788,000 doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a lot of money. And, and, um, and I know that, you know, the county probably is going to appreciate it, get it back, but I'd rather not have to give them any back. Um, that if we can, uh, and I understand the unforeseen, uh, you know, I, um, uh, I certainly get that, but um, um, I, I just, uh, uh, I'm uncomfortable with that, with, with um, not, um, you know, following that um, a little more closely uh, earlier in the year. Um, so as we come up with cuts that we've had to make an instruction or, you know, whatever it might be that, um, you know, maybe, maybe half a million could help if we, uh, but I know once, once we hit June 30, if they're not capital projects, or we don't have enough capital projects, whatever's left over goes back to the county. Is, am I right about that? We can ask for any type of expenditure through your year-end spending plan. The only, the only rest only, isn't that generally, you know, after June 30 or whatever's left over, um, the, the county encourages the use of that money for capital projects. Yeah, that's it all. It does. And we do evaluate our budget beginning in February. We pay attention to the March ADM because there's adjustments to our state revenue. We have in the past um, funded things that were cut out of the budget through the year end, right. prior to the year end spending plans. Gotcha. Okay. So we do look at those things. Um, this year, we didn't have really any big one-time expenditures. You don't want to use it for repetitive expenditures because then you can't sustain it in future budgets. Sure. So those one-time expenditures we do look at and see if we can address them prior to June 30th, typically in March and April. We have discussions as cabinet and talk to the superintendent and try to figure out how we can fund some of those things that we can't always fund through our operating budget. So we do do that process. Uh, uh, and you help me out with this too. Um, computers, I, iPads, um, that's not capital, is it? The next no. part of instruction? Okay. What's uh, half a million dollars? How many, how many laptops or, or iPads is that going to buy? Because I, I know couldn't answer. We, did, we, we didn't, well, I, I'm, <laughs> that's a rhetorical question. I'm sorry, I'm not going <laughs> to, but, um, I, you know, I know that was one of the things that um, we didn't fully fund some of our IT stuff that um, we might have been able to. As a one, you know, and, and you're right, it's a one-time thing. Well, and, and the stuff that we didn't fund, we do put on a three-year cycle. So again, that would be a repetitive in the future. While it might not impact the immediate next budget, we still would have to pay attention to that, whether we'd be able to sustain it long-term. I just, I think that's a lot of money to um, have at the end. That's all. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Cook. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your uh, review of, of, of the recommendation, and, and I support it. Um, I just want to ask um, a little bit more um, about the bus, the logic behind the recommending the, the eight buses. So just to sort of in layman's terms, we had to pull it out of the budget we're currently in. We anticipate not being able to stick with our replacement plan next year because we know some pressure, pressures are coming our way that will be tough. So that's why we're asking for those now. Correct. Okay. So we don't kick the can down the road. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
And with regard to leaving some cushion in the contingency, um, what happens if that money is unspent? That it would be returned to the city and county at the time that at it, the that project time. closed. Okay, great. Um, and I think that um, I, I think it's really I, I think this division relies more heavily on its local funding partners than most divisions do. And for that reason, as painful as it might be to send money back to the localities, because I'm sure we could think of a lot of um, ways to spend it, I think that it, uh, part to echo what Mrs. Minor said, you know, congratulations on your award, and I think it was given to you for a reason. So I think that that dynamic, even though it can get complicated with the funding coming and then going back and, and these requests, so I think it is good to maintain that level of transparency and trust. And so I do appreciate that very much. And um, if you could also um, remind us of what the timeline is for next steps, if the board uh, approves this request, uh, this recommendation tonight, what, what then happens? Absolutely. It goes to the Board of Supervisors on October the 11th. They have a public hearing beginning at 6.30 and their official meeting would begin at 7 o'clock. Then on October 13th is the City Council meeting where they would hear this item at 2 p.m. Any, any other board members have comments from some questions from Ms. Berto? Uh, just a couple of things. You're under budget for the Lafayette gym, but you're not under contract yet. Correct. The projected estimate. So right now you're under budget based upon the estimate that comes from the engineering company. So until until you're under contract. Correct. I wouldn't I would I would say that you're not quite under budget yet. I would wait until the until those bids come in. Um, cuz we never know what the market Design is under budget. <laughs> the designers told you they built something under budget. Got it. Um, and then the eight buses that eight buses that we uh, are looking at what that really does is reduces our ask for next year to take some pressure off of the off of the operating budget in the in in the in the coming year, which correct which and is allows a, our replacement cycle to continue. Right, and um, uh, you know I know I know that you're you you manage this this money pretty closely. Um, at what point do you start talking to the county about a county and the city about okay we're looking at maybe having this much money left over and and kind of partner with their with their financial folks to develop this year-end spending plan? It's an ongoing process. Um, they communicate with me what the expectation is that they need in order to help us on, on the capital side, and we try to balance that with our needs versus what the county and city need to help support us. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think, I think one of the things which has really served this school division well in the last few years is a trust and partnership between our two funding bodies. We, we are unique in that we have two funding bodies versus most school divisions that have one. And so we have to make sure that we're working closely with them and uh, that they understand where our money's going and that they, there's good transparency and, and trust there. So, um, uh, and I appreciate the good work that, that you and your team have done. Um, I get the award, but I, 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 I see it on a more personal nature and, and, how, and how you guys manage the budget and how you really work with um, the city and the county to, to, to be transparent, tell them this is where we are, and uh, you know, develop that trust. Because that's, that's going forward is what really is going to help the school division meet its needs and, to, and uh, uh, we'll never meet our needs because we always have more needs than we have resources. But, uh, to do that, and, and as Mrs. Cook said, with our index going down, with not having less funding coming from the state because of because of that, that, that trust is even more important. So, uh, appreciate that. Thank you. So, with that, it's been moved and seconded to approve the financial report and year-end spending plan for the year ended June 30th, 2016. Ms. Serza? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Minor. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. Uh, 9.02. Can I get a motion to award a contract for invitation for bid number 17-1115, phase 1B <coughs> construction, new middle school to Oyster Point Construction Company in the amount of $21,817,000. Mr. Chair, I move approval of award a contract for invitation for bid number 17-1115, phase 1B construction of a new middle school to Oyster Point Construction Company in the amount of $21,817,000. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion from board members? 
Would Mrs. Like, Hummel. Yeah, I, I'd like to just um, uh, comment on some of uh, the comments I've heard from different community members, and I just want to make sure uh, that the school board uh, hears the comments about um, making sure that we are going to uh, build a school uh, with a construction management oversight so that we will not have uh, some of the problems that came uh, in the past with some of our schools, um, like Claire Bird Baker, what was it? It wasn't uh, attached to. There were the walls and the roof weren't the attached. Walls were not attached. <laughs> so we're going to make sure that's not happening again. We're going to make sure that you know the gym actually meets the design specifications, um, so we don't run into the problem with um, that Matoka Elementary ran into. And we are very, very <coughs> confident that by putting the money into a construction management firm, we will should feel and that the community should feel good about um, choosing this contractor and making sure that everything happens as it's supposed to happen. Does anyone else have anything to say? Any other discussion? Yeah, we do. Uh, I'm Ms. sorry. Dr. Beers. Um, this is, is not the construction management company. No, we have, no, but they will be overseen by a construction yes, management company. Yes, there will be no We've already approved and, that. Um, and, I, 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 and that has been, that, that firm has been identified? Yeah, yes. we approved yeah. it. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to, and, and I, I really would echo that, is that, um, um, although I, I know that um, um, the Oyster Point Company has built a lot around here, um, and uh, um, there have been, you know, some problems, but um, uh, I, I, I think, I don't think there's going to be, you know, an issue if we've got uh, a real, real competent oversight. That's what I would say. It was interesting, Mr. Riley from Oyster Point and I had a brief conversation, and he said, remember when I had to promise you that Berkeley would be on time and opened? And we did it. And so I have every confidence that James Blair will be on time, on budget, and opened when we say. Uh, and Mr. Riley, I'm sure, will make sure that happens for us along with the design team. So I'm confident in this. this uh, grant. Uh, any other discussion? Board. Mrs. Cook. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if the administration could just talk for a minute about the um, work that the construction management firm has done already with value engineering and, and, and development of the RFP, and then what the what the work is moving forward. Um, you know, just what what's typically done. If that could be <coughs> explained, that would be helpful. Good evening, Mr. Snipes. Good evening, board members. Um, your question again, can you repeat yeah. that one? If you, if you could just refresh uh, our memories and what the construction management firm has already done for us vis-a-vis -vis this project and then what you anticipate they, they will be doing moving forward. The construction management firm was, was uh, awarded and we hired them to help us manage the VE process, which they were part of, and now they've helped us with phase 1A, which was partial demolition of James Blair. Their next, the next thing what they will be doing is helping us with meetings as probably as early as this week with Oyster Point and setting up preliminary uh, pre-construction meetings to determine what, where, what the expectations are. And JCC purchasing will also be involved in those meetings. So they're typically on site? And yes, they're on site right now. They have someone on site every day, boots on the ground, five days a week. Well, sometimes seven days a week, depends on what's going on on the weekend. Any other questions from board members? Thank you, Mr. Snipes. I appreciate it. It's been moved and seconded to award a contract for, for invitation for bid number 171115, phase 1B construction, new middle school to Oyster Point Construction Company, amount of $21,817,000. Ms. Serza? Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Minor? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? No. Mrs. Young? No. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Uh, 9.03, approve motion to, have a motion to approve Colonial Webb's proposal to replace the Stonehouse Elementary School of Chiller for $132,877. Mr. Chairman, I move item 9.03, approval of Colonial Webb's proposal to replace the Stonehouse Elementary Chiller for $132,877. Thank you, Mrs. Miner. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? 
discuss this at the work session a couple weeks ago. So it's moved and second to approve Colonial Webb's proposal to replace a Stunhouse Elementary School chiller for $132,877. Mrs. Serza? Ms. Minor? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Uh, can I get a motion to approve resolution giving the City of Williamsburg permanent access to school board property at Ironbound and Long Hill Road at the James Blair site? Mr. Chair, I move approval of item 9.04, approve a resolution giving the City of Williamsburg permanent access to school board property at Ironbound and Long Hill Road at the James Blair site. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? I have a, a, a question. Um, as I was out and about um, and, and finally looked at the plat outline, will there be an impact on the use of Cooley Field for spring sports practices, et cetera? Are we going to have a similar issue as the gym issue? Are we going to have to not use those fields this spring? And have we made plans? Talking about James Blair? Yeah, James Blair. James Blair site will not be able to have access to it while construction is underway. Okay, and, the, and Cooley Field during the... No, 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 no access. access. Okay, so... so in, it's a sa it, would, it would be a safety issue for us. A safety them, issue. Yeah. So I, I'm presuming that we've... Dr. Heron, I'm presuming that we've already made the adjustments with practice and games and... Yes, we've worked very hard to build a schedule for all the athletic activities to be moved away from James Blair uh, oh, for the full year. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Any other board member comments? I, I just Mrs. have a, Young? I just have a question. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Thank Chair. You. Uh, I just have a question about uh, what role parks and recreation make in this when they know that the school division, for example, we're building the school at James Blair. What accommodations do they make for for the school division's needs? The school division's needs are for yes, their for own. practice fields games etc um just you're asking if parks and recs allows us to use their fields because of this construction right address we have a memorandum of understanding with parks and rec to use our facilities um we have not engaged in any conversation from an operation standpoint but if schools reach out to them they can reach out to the jcc parks and rec department to discuss use of their facilities individual schools follow up and uh, find places to meet their needs during the year Thank you, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Snipes. Right. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Moved and seconded the approved resolution giving the City of Williamsburg permanent access to school board property at Ironbound and Long Hill Road, James Blair site. Ms. Serza? Mrs. Taylor? No. Mrs. Young? No. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Minor? Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. Can I get a motion to renew contract for power school assessment and analytics for fiscal year 2017 in the amount of $122,875? I move that we approve action item 9.05 to renew the contract for power school assessment and analytics for fiscal year 2017 in the amount of $122,875. There a second. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Hummel. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Is there any discussion from board members? Excellent. It's been moved and seconded to renew the contract for power school assessment and analytics for fiscal year 2017, the amount of $122,875. Mrs. Zerza? Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Minor? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. That brings us to 10.01, Capital Improvement Development Committee recommended 10-year capital improvement plan, Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, this evening, uh, Ms. Berta will present uh, the recommendations from the Capital Improvement Development Committee. Ms. Berta has chaired that committee this year. That we've had a new process to look at capital improvements, and she's going to explain the process and the recommendations from the committee this evening. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. As we begin to discuss the recommendations of the Capital Improvement Development Committee for the fiscal year 18 through 27 Capital Improvement Plan, please keep a few things in mind. Number one, 
The following presentation is representative of the CIP Development Committee's re recommendations. Number two, the revised CIP process with an earlier presentation allows for more time for community and school board input. Number three, between tonight's presentation and the superintendent's recommendation for a CIP at the second meeting in October, there will be continued analysis of the recommended projects and their placement. Changes may occur. A capital improvement committee was formed in the summer of 2016. It was comprised of division staff, including three principals, one from each level, elementary, middle, and high, and three community members. The development process started earlier in the fiscal year to allow for the work of the committee and community input and school board review. Call center managers were asked to submit requests for projects. The committee evaluated these requests using a specific rubric with specific criteria and weight assigned to each. Upon the completion of the rubric, projects were either included in the committee's recommended CIP, excluded due to not meeting the city or county's required threshold of $50,000 per project, excluded and addressed immediate, immediately through the operating budget with operations and maintenance, or will be addressed in a future operating budget. These decisions will be shared with cost center managers to ensure open communication. I think I skipped a slide. I did. The committee met on four occasions to discuss the CIP process, reviewed the request, requested projects, and evaluated the facility condition index recommended projects. To provide context, the following was also provided to the committee. The September 2015 enrollment report, because that was the most recent enrollment report available, the facility and condition index process and report, the current academic space use and future anticipated programmatic changes, as well as the cost center project request. Beginning with the development of the 2017 through 2026 CIP, the school board began to develop a 10-year CIP. The county and city adopt a five-year CIP. The 10-year CIP allows the school division to project and plan for future needs beyond the five-year plan. The committee focused primarily on fiscal year 18, since that is the next immediately funded year in the plan. Discussion occurred about project placement in years 2 through 10. All projects presented in the CIP include anticipated A&E cost as appropriate and necessary at a rate of 10%, contingency at a rate of 5%, and an assumption of escalation at a rate of 3% annually. A new project may appear in the CIP for the first time due to new or updated information, for example, an emergency, a state requirement, or a safety issue. The following si slides will detail increases or decreases in the project cost. Faithful and Gould estimates within the FCI were based on industry standards and no actual quotes were obtained in the final FCI report. On several projects, staff and third-party evaluations determined that additional scope were necessary in order to complete the projects. The following slides will highlight changes to fiscal year 18 from last year's adopted CIP. This could include changes in project cost, changes to recommended year of the request, additions due to immediate need, or deletions of projects from the recommended plan. The first project we will discuss is the Jamestown High School HVAC replacement. Staff acquired updated esti estimates for the total replacement of this project. The fiscal year CIP projected the project would occur over a two-year period. The recommendation after talking with contractors is to extend this project over three years to spread out the cost. Also, the contractor would not be able to complete the entire project in one summer. By doing this over three years and with the updated quote, this project decreased from last year's plan by 153,776 over three years with an immediate decrease of 380,000 in fiscal year 18. The Rawls Bird Elementary HVAC replacement originally was included in the fiscal year 18 to replace components of the system. Upon staff evaluation, it is determined that the system is past the estimated useful life and a component replacement creates issues with the controls. 
The recommendation is to replace the entire system over the next three years. This is an increase over three years of 4,047,417 with an impact on fiscal year 18 of a 66,417 increase. The Lafayette High School roof replacement. The original scope of this project in the facility condition index was to replace with like roofing. Additional scope is required to provide the most economical re approach and replacement of all necessary components. Replace, the recommendation is to replace with a PVC roofing and all components as outlined in the updated scope. This is a $1,427,601 increase. I would like to say this project is still under review due to the estimated increase in the cost on the most recent information received. Roofing materials as outlined in this estimate range from $6 to $20 per square foot. This estimate is calculated using the midpoint of that range. This project estimate could change due to further research and analysis by our operations team. DJ Montague entrance redesign. The scope of the project has been updated to include hardware for a badge access system. With the updated scope, this would increase this project by 20,000. The DJ Montague Elementary parking lot and sidewalk corrections. This is a new project for fiscal year 2018 that will address the parking lot and sidewalk modifications necessary for the division to meet accessibility requirements. The recommendation is to perform these corrections in 2018 this is an $80,500 increase. This project has to be completed in order for us to gain our accessibility with OCR. Jamestown High School EFS repair. EFS is exterior insulation finishing system. This is a new project in the CIP for fiscal year 18. It is a continuation of funding that was received in fiscal year 17. Upon further investigation when the project began this year, it was identified that there was additional um, repairs that needed to be performed so that the cleaning that was funded in fiscal year 17 wouldn't further damage the EFs. This is again? an increase of 86,500. What is that again? Exterior insulation finishing system. Don't ask me, Mr. Snipes, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> What, what is it exactly? That's we'll what we're all asking. If you can, <laughs> listen, we've debated how to pronounce that word up and down, so believe just, me, uh, not everybody's sure about it. But if you look at, if you think of Jamestown High School, and you look, uh, <laughs> say, around the gym, and you look, and you see that flat wall system mm -hmm. uh, that looks kind of like cream colored, uh, it's, a, it's the finish to the outside. I won't go into how it's made, but it's... Um, <clears throat> you won't see it very much on current projects because it's a less expensive material. And as we're seeing in this project, it doesn't always hold up very well. Like in the new school, there isn't any. But in some of the older schools, Rawls Bird has it, several of them. If you go up to it and it looks at the flat, uh, almost like a home type exterior that you'd see, um, especially up above, it's usually like above the brickwork, uh, that's where you would find it. Uh, if you punched it hard enough, you could poke a hole in it. It's a softer material. So it deteriorates over time because of water and other things? Uh, <clears throat> yes, and it's especially vulnerable to mildew and, and getting dirty, which is why when, F, uh, when Faithful Ghoul looked at it, they saw the dirt and said, let's well, clean it. Washing. Then when we got the roofer up this year when we were re-roofing the school, they looked at it more closely and realized there are a lot of pits and cracks and other damage, and the uh, pressure washing would have destroyed it. So the 86,500 is an increase of what was the original project amount? 60. 63,500. <clears throat> and this will repair it, then clean it and repaint it. So they're going to replace it with the exact same material? They won't be replacing it uh, and taking it off completely. They're going to be repairing what's there. Otherwise, it'd be much more expensive because it's a lot of it on the school. Uh, what they're going to do are fill in the cracks, fill in the holes, uh, do some basic cleaning, and then repaint it. How many of our other schools have this? I'd have to check to give you an exact number, but a lot of them, you know, the, back in that particular time period. I mean, I'm trying to remember, but I can find out for you. I'm just curious as to whether these are going to pop up on 
future they, they CIPs? Are. Part of the problem with this one is because of the height of the building. It's a you know, high school and much larger and a little harder to get to it. We clean uh, many of the other schools on a fairly regular basis. We do some power washing, did, just did some at two or three schools. So it doesn't get to be a problem if you keep it up. Thank you. The Lafayette High School football practice and field lighting, field hockey lighting, originally was recommended in fiscal year 18. At the recommendation of the committee, this project has been moved to 2023. The movement is due to the request of further investigation of all high school fields. Following the receipt of that information, we can determine where it's best to recommend adding this into a more appropriate year in the CIP. This would have an impact of a decrease of 516,977. Could you explain a little bit more about that? The a discussion incurred about this and actually the walkway to Warhill, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The CIP committee felt like it was important for us to look at equity amongst all of our high schools to determine which fields had lighting at all of the high schools to determine if we needed to add projects at Jamestown or Warhill into the CIP so there was some equity across our high schools as to project placement for these. Again, this is a recommendation of the committee. It's subject to change. This is not the end all be all or the superintendent's proposed CIP. But the committee really wanted additional research and information about those two projects, namely to make sure that we were providing equity across the division. So. Yeah, that's confusing to me because the equity right now is clearly, um, it's inequitable right now at Lafayette High School. So that, that's confusing to me I because think the, the other. The other committee wanted an official report so that it could actually be documented and there could be data provided um, to the division, to the public at large about what true facilities we have with our athletic fields. That was a discussion that ensued in committee, and it's certainly open to negotiation or movement. I think I think we'll continue our conversations with that because that's that's something that I think is a very very easy thing to document, and I thought it had already been documented. <coughs> so it would be just a matter of confirming what's already been documenting documented. So there wasn't a report that could be provided to the committee. So I'm a bit concerned about what really exists. And, and upon that discussion, we felt like it was better for us to have everything lined out to ensure that what the decisions were made really did outline all of the needs of the division. And for the lighting, since that's a, a, a kind of a, a very specific thing, isn't that something that the school administration could um, provide that documentation to the committee? That's part of, in our four meetings, that was not available, and that's part of why that committee wanted additional information. But we'll certainly uh, make every effort to get that information for the board before they, we make a final decision on the capital improvement plan that moves forward. Yeah. So, so just from my understanding, so, so we're trying to document whether Jamestown has foot, football field has lighting, Lafayette football field has lighting, and Warhill football field has lighting. I think lighting. it was athletics in general, athletic facilities in general, not just one specific thing. Yeah, may I ask a question about this? Um, um, first of all, this has been a long-standing request of Lafayette. It, it is, isn't that true? It continues um, to move every year, from what yes, I understand. Yes, and right now we, we, are, we are in need of practice fields for our, our athletic teams, and it seems to me, and I guess my other question is, how much will this official report cost? Because if it costs as much as the $516,977, which it seems to me a lot of these reports get rather expensive, wouldn't it be wiser just to go ahead and install the lighting? Instead think, of pay for a report, our, I think our division staff could combine the could compile the report. I don't think it's necessary to go out to a third party. Mrs. Yeah. Young, we will endeavor to gather the information and put it into a report for the school board so that we're aware of the lighting at the various fields. We'll we will make every effort to do that as soon as possible. Okay, thank you, Dr. Heron. I'm I'm just concerned about. Uh, the ongoing needs of Lafayette, we know that the, that facility is inequitable. I mean, I, it's obvious. My first visit there, it became very 
apparent to me as a, a board member that that facility had not was not um, equitable to the other um, high schools. And so to me, this just seems um, almost non sequitur, in my opinion, to to what we already know. I I don't. I'm not sure I understand the need for any more reports. I think, and I certainly will oppose the fact that this is. Uh, that we're not going to do this. Please keep in mind my opening remarks that this is the committee's recommendation. This right. is not the superintendent's proposed. The reason that we are presenting this information early and the reason we formed a committee was to allow for discussion, just like what's happening, for the community to input, for the school board to input. And that's why this process is good. And this is not the end all be all. I don't know that Dr. Heron is going to recommend what the committee has recommended. That's part of this process and we've got to work through this and and I don't want to cause a stir but I want to share with you what the committee has said and their concerns about projects and wanting more detail. Right and I understand that and I do appreciate um, everything that you do. I, um, I'm aware that, that this is in the discussion issue but I guess this for me would be a real sticking point. It Just, is a discussion issue but yes. I mean, that's part of this process. Thank you. Thank you. This is Cook. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to uh, also uh, thank you for this process. And as we uh, begin to approach the CIP in a different way, I think this is going to end up being, you know, year-round uh, discussion uh, in partnership with uh, those that fund us. I just have a request um, with regard to information that comes to the board on this topic, and and that is when we're discussing parity uh, across facilities, if if you could provide a little context with the information, um, specifically, you know, the driving force behind, uh, faci you know, facility differences, uh, it, it, because, and who paid for that and whose CIP it was in and that sort of thing, because I think there's a history there in our community in terms of who requested lighting. And so if, if when we're talking about parity, if we could get a little bit of that context and history with it, that would be very, very helpful and help us understand the, the bigger pic picture and history. We'll do our best. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Beers. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, because uh, they make up almost half the community. I'd like to know the names of the three principals and the three community members. Sure. Um, our elementary principal was Kathy Vasquez. Middle school principal was Tracy Jones. High school principal was Kathy Worley. Colonial Williamsburg representative was Robert Underwood. William and Mary's representative was Van Dobson. And there was a representative from Newtown Management, Randy Casey Rutland. And how were the community members chosen? Um, they were vetted when Dr. Constantino was here. Um, there was a process where we were trying to determine whether individuals lived or worked in the county to see their expertise. And they were phoned and asked if they wanted to participate in the committee. And is the committee, um, what's the term of the people on the committee? Do Just we know one that? year. One year. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the 2018 CIP is the high school pathways renovation and a chemistry lab at Warhill. As you know, the division received state grants to plan high school innovation. A change was requested to the current academic space use, and that is being brought forward. Warhill High School has requested creating a chemistry lab and maker space for the Pathways project. The CIP Development Committee evaluated this request and supported the addition into the CIP. Additionally, a placeholder in fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20 was made for Jamestown and Lafayette in anticipation for the requested pathways related space changes. The impact on 2018 is a $300,000 increase. Um, I have a question about that as well because when I was looking at it, um, to me I was looking at, and this is just a discussion, uh, that so your uh, the recommendation is three hundred thousand for um, it's a maker maker lab sort of thing mm -hmm. right and then three hundred thousand uh, for another high school the next year and then three hundred thousand for another high school the next year and I guess I'm wondering um, once again it's 
it's an equity issue in that one high school who already has um, this, a lot of this capability is going to be getting more capability and then another high school is going to have to wait three years. And so I guess my, my point to the committee would be uh, that we look at that also from an equity issue. It's one thing to, to have kind of this rotating, um, fixing roofs and HVAC systems and things like that. But when you're talking about um, direct uh, classroom supplies that really make a difference uh, to the students that we're teaching, um, that's a difference between one student having access to that for their uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year and another student missing out on that. So it's just a, uh, or just having his high school have it for his senior year. So it's just, you know, I look at this as, okay, there's a high school that will now have this capability for four years and others that will only have it for one year during uh, a typical high school person's life in WJCC. So that, that's, it begs a bigger equity issue, but I'm just throwing it out there. Mrs. Hummel, if I could add to, to that conversation, um, obviously Warhill is one year ahead and they're, they've planned their grant and they're implementing this year without the space and uh, Lafayette High School and Jameson High School have just started the planning process so it's too early yet to really understand what their needs are for their particular academy requirements but as, as those become more evident we'll be in a better place to even know the cost involved for each of the two schools coming on board so we're, we're in a, a process where one school is a year out in the, in the process for this particular type of of learning space um, so, so they are a little bit different and we and are, can, I, we are I, I looking towards that. equity yeah. by putting a placeholder in the budget in anticipation of their needs and I can totally appreciate that and I don't want to take anything away from Warhill High School sure. for all the work they've done in implementing this I want to congratulate and laud them for all of this I just want to make sure that when we're uh, looking at the CIP that um, it's not going to be, oh, who's going to be angling for what year gets. Absolutely. And I think if both high schools are ready to move this time next year, that will be a conversation in committee as to whether they both need to come in the same year. That's something we really can't determine at this moment in time. Okay. But thank you for your comments. The final recommendation from the CIP committee is to remove the walkway to Warhill project. The committee has requested once again an additional study to determine if there's a need for this request still and or to provide an alternative solution. I'm sure this one will spark discussion too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you don't look at me. <laughs> as, as an observation, as an observation, it would, um, Having data for decision making is a really good thing and I, and I appreciate that the committee wants that. However, needing to push back five years seems a little, a little beyond the pale for the kind of material and information that we need to get to that issue. And the walkway doesn't have anything here. We just took it out because we took it out but we didn't ask for the data about why it was essential and I think there probably is some data sitting out there somewhere that maybe we need to provide to the committee. That would be my observation on that because, because there's been a request and it's been there around a long time. So I'm thinking at some point someone, it's, I'm hoping Mr. Robertson knows what file it might be buried in, but maybe not. <laughs> but at least ask, I would ask the committee to at least ask for the study before just saying, Bleh. just my impression of that. Is the, com is the committee's work done? I mean, this is their recommendation. The committee's work right. is done. So now it's, now it's yours mm -hmm. and then it's ours. Right. Okay. Um, so with regard to the walkway to Warhol, I, I just wanted to say that um, in the interim, however that 
pans out whether it's something that the county wants or to do from a parks and rec standpoint or something that the school division feels that it needs for its athletes and as we weigh that against our larger needs um, in the meantime kids are walking using it and which I think is unsafe and so I, I hope that the administration thinks about something about that topic between now and whenever a decision is made and whenever because in the meantime they're walking there we know it it's unsafe um, and so um, I'm not I'm not comfortable with that um, I'll let you finish it I have a broader overarching question but I will be quiet in the short term sure I, I mean mr. chair yes, I, I I agree with on this I I mean having gone down into the depths of that swamp um, and struggling back up the hill and I realize I'm not 14 15 16 but to, to me I think we're being irresponsible not funding this project uh, I mean it's an ongoing need for Lafayette High School to have that walkway so um, since this is a discussion um, I, I guess it says additional study but it doesn't say that we need the recommended information I would ask that whatever information Mr. Robertson has or, or Mr. Snipes on this would be provided so that we can make a, a decision about this because I mean this I mean this is on here again and I would really like to see this resolved permanently for our students so thank you Mr. Beers? yeah we're um, we're the board's going to uh, deal with uh, not just the committee's recommendations but the CIP <clears throat> in in subsequent board meetings um, and this is just going to be part of um, the information that comes forward there so we don't uh, I mean I've, I've, I could start to comment on just about everything in here and, and realize that you know it really isn't necessary because these if these are recommendations uh, from the committee it's going to come to the superintendent it's going to come to the board and, and we'll talk about it and, and we'll uh, we'll make the you know we'll make the final uh, uh, decision about that but I uh, um, and I certainly uh, uh, recognize uh, and appreciate the work that you know the committee has done. Uh, I don't have to agree with <laughs> everything that's in it, but that's but that's um, that's not, and you know that's not their you know their role is to uh, you know from their perspective, um, and our role is going to be from our perspective. So, I'm Dr. Heron. Um, thank you, Dr. Beers. I, I think in consideration of the committee's recommendation, one of the, the things to keep in mind as we bring information to you as a board um, is to consider the amount of funding that may be available. And if we do add some things that the board would prefer to do in the capital improvement plan, it, it will possibly lead to taking some of the current recommend, recommended projects out. So just to keep in mind that there, there, there there's a limited amount of funding available and just to look at the information we've given to you and, and see it through that lens as to what you may choose to put in and what you may choose to to take out but your comments tonight are very helpful mm -hmm. in helping us build a, a final recommendation thank you and, and, I, and I realize that part of the county's planning is there's going to be a new comprehensive plan for park and rec and I'm looking at some of the out items for lighting our sport fields at like Stonehouse and I'm pretty sure that we don't have Stonehouse students there at night that need lighting so perhaps we need to discuss with park and rec that that maybe they want to move that into their master plan along with you know the lighting at Tawano I don't think there's many middle school sport activities after dark um, so as I go through the list there might be some opportunity to negotiate with the counties as they're developing their their comprehensive plan for the park and rec programs the next several slides will provide you with a look at the five-year CIP request and the associated cost and percentage of the five-year recommended plan the first slide is HVAC and window replacements as you can see, there's a number of schools that are slated to have HVAC repairs or replacements. Toano Middle School is the only school slated for a window replacement over the next five years. 
the total cost would be sixteen thousand two twenty nine three ten or thirty percent of our five year CIP. Next is roof replacement and repair and refurbishments. Roof replacements and repairs cover five schools, entrance redesigns at a number of our schools, and refurbishments being carpet, tile, paints, and restroom renovations. And remember in the facility condition index that the refurbishments are to be component replacements rather than total school replacements. This total over five years would be 10,207,461 or 19% of the total five-year CIP. Other projects include exterior repairs, electrical repairs or replacements, auditorium seating, well removals, refrigerator freezers, parking lots, fire panels, playground equipment. The total for all of those over five years would be 7,490,634 or 14% of our five-year CIP. And finally, our facilities and new construction. The Warhill Pathways Makerspace and Chemistry Lab, High School Pathways Renovation. In the five-year plan, there is design for high school capacity expansions and construction for high school capacity expansions. The total of this is estimated to be 20,336,526 or 37% of our total CIP. So here's a snapshot of what the five-year funding request would look like in the committee's recommended CIP. 5,941,478 in fiscal year 18, 8,825,436 in fiscal year 19, 9,280,877 in fiscal year 20, 7,069,392 in 21, and fiscal year 22, 23,146,748 for a total five year recommended CIP of 54,263,931. This concludes the presentation of the CIP committee's recommendation. I would like to thank the members of the committee for their active participation, engagement, and input. At the October 4th meeting, there will be a public hearing for community input. Thank you, and are there any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, uh, I mean, we work on smoothing the, the re bus replacement. Is there any chance of of smoothing some of these CIP projects where instead of, for example, in 2018, we have 5,941,478 um, dollars. Is it, there any possibility of making them all equal, like 10 or $11 million a year? That would be a discussion that we would have to have with our funding partners. Um, based on last year's estimated five-year plan, that would not work. Um, Currently, with the projected fiscal year 18 recommendation, we are already 1.7 million over what the county and city estimated funding was for fiscal year 18. That is directly attributed to the parking lot that we need to take care of at DJ Montague, the EFS repair at Jamestown, the Lafayette High School roof, and then the Pathways program. So we're already over what the plan was between city and county and that's going to require a lot of communication and open dialogue so that we can continue that trust and balance and i thank you because i know you've been um, a huge part of making sure that we do have transparency and cooperation with the county so thank you Ms. Cook? Um, was there any discussion about um i know that replacement buses are part of the operational budget but um CIP would be new buses. So I'm curious if that came up in terms of bringing a new school online. Did I, was that in here? It did school? not. Um, I don't know if Mr. Snipes has any additional information about I what don't, we project we will need. I don't think we've made it that far in the okay. process, but that could be forthcoming. Yeah, so I would, yeah. Um, and that kind of segues into, so there are a couple of um, requests by the committee for more information, some studies to, to gather information. Um, uh, so that that would be another one transportation with a new school coming online. I'm curious, did any, um, I mean, I figured that part of this process would be a, a bigger CIP request um, because it's a more thorough process, a more thoughtful process um, for, for which I'm grateful. Um, but are there any other studies out there that, that we need to think about as a division um, that didn't come up in the committee that um, maybe athletic facilities or other studies that might help us plan, you know, maybe 
beyond five years, but as we start building into the future and being able to communicate and plan. Enrollment reports are going to be critical as we begin to see those. Um, fortunately for Williamsburg, James City County, we are still are a growing community. Um, that's not the case for everyone. So the the juggling act of figuring out when exactly you need that school to open to support the student enrollment is is tricky. It's an ebb and flow. So that's a that's a big component of this, especially since in the out year we have an elementary design based on what we looked at as a committee for enrollment, as well as the high school expansions. Right. Um, and then I, I appreciate what your explanation about how you kind of gathered everything and then and then and then reallocated to okay where to do that, but we'll put that in an operating budget. And so, do you feel confident that you kind of caught everything this time? Do you feel yes. pretty good about that? Yes. And I think the open communication back with our cost center managers is critical. It's my understanding from communication with cost center managers that that hasn't happened in the past. Okay. So that is one of my goals as an outcome of this committee is that I share with them what the decision was and how we're going to address their situation. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Um, I, I have one. Be because we're going to innovation at the high schools and because we know there's, we're approaching capacity issues at the high school, what is the impact on space use with these innovative programs and is it appropriate to expand schools when you have innovation or are we really looking at a, a, another high school? I mean, there's a, how, programmatically, how will that work? Um, my sense is if you want to be innovative and allow children, students a lot of opportunities, we can do some off campus and in other ways, but at some point we're going to utilize the space very differently than we did when they all sat row on row behind one another, 25, 30 to a room. And so, I, so is expansion the way really to master that or is it really fa modern facilities to accomplish that? And so I think, it, I think this is great, but I think there are conversations that we're going to need to start before we even do the dollars and cents. Or the do actually, those conversations will drive the dollars and cents. And this is I have three meetings, so I'll stop bothering you in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question, probably more for Mr. Robertson, about um, there was a board member earlier who uh, asked a very good question. Um, about PVC roofing and what PVC roofing is. The board member seems to like guns and roses too, but can you explain what, uh, what is PVC this? roofing is? That's my question. <laughs> I can really get you a better definition of what I'm going to give you, but it's a type of membrane roof. So it's the type of, it looks like a rubberized type of fabric membrane uh, as opposed to a metal roof or some other kinds of materials. There are a range of membrane roofs. Yeah. This is probably a, a median level. What's the current roof on Lafayette? Uh, it is a membrane roof, but it's a little lower quality. Uh, but I, I don't know any specifics about it other than that. Has it been replaced since they did the renovation in 97? Uh, that is the last time it was placed on there. There you go. Gotcha. What is the life expectancy of uh, the PVC roof? Generally, you're talking about 20 years for most roof uh, materials of that type. So the current roof that is on there is already. Yes. It's, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So, it's reached it. its so limit. Let me ask the really a question I don't want to ask. So we still have HVAC on that roof and people walking on that membrane? <laughs> That's, uh, yes. So my memory serves me well that at some point we had floods in Lafayette when the membrane roof started leaking? A uh, long time ago. Yeah, we did. Yeah. So where are we in the stage of leaks at Lafayette? Uh, nothing at that level whatsoever. I mean, we've had some the small goodness. leaks. Uh, we really haven't had that level of leak anywhere. We've been fairly lucky and been able to maintain that. Because that got the carpet wet and created all kinds of issues. Yeah. Yep. Yes. It was pretty horrible. Dr. Beers? Yeah, I, I remember when this came up earlier this spring, and, and, I, and I, I actually sent an email, I think, to the superintendent, um, talking, you know, asking what's what's the cost difference, how long do they last uh, between this kind of roof and a, and a pitched um, metal roof. And it was my understanding that the pitched metal roof probably costs more, but it lasts a lot longer. So why? Um, it, it's, it, it, and when I looked at the numbers, it didn't look like they were prohibitively higher than uh, a membrane roof. 
Uh, wow. I have to admit I'm not an expert in that area, but I know that when we did Rawls Bird, uh, we did look at that. And for that school, that size school, we did put a metal roof on there, on the pods, uh, and it worked very well. And you're right, the upfront costs are typically much more expensive. And of course, the nature of the building, if you have multiple levels, uh, like Lafayette, where you've got, you know, it's, it's tiered, so to speak. Uh, it makes it a little bit more expensive, a little bit more difficult. Um, I mean, that's something we certainly could explore in the future. We just have not ever taken that direction because of the cost. If I could intervene just for a moment, um, because of, there was a big difference between the original cost estimate for the roof, which was a very basic roof compared to the one that's brought forward, I've asked staff to go back and have another evaluation done us and give us some options to present to the board uh, in terms of the quality of roof that we can put on or afford to put on the school. So we will bring you back a little bit more information on that one particular sure. item because we would several questions. Well, about, I know we've, we've, we have, and, and you know, all the newer schools have them, but we've, um, I know we've retrofitted other, other schools with uh, pitch metal roofs. So I, I was just, you know, I'm, I'm just curious about that, Alan. We can check. I mean, the, some of the newer roofs and the style that they use, the still membrane roofs are very energy efficient. Um, so it, it, the main difference is the longevity. Sure. And it is expensive to retrofit a pitched roof where you have a flat roof because yeah. you got to move the HVAC and then you got to put the piping and the ventilation and the I, I understand. Yada, yada, I understand. yada. A lot of little extras that go along the way. Right. Exactly. When you do it in the beginning, it can be better. but. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, one quick explanation too, when you talk about roofs and the, and the changes in cost and, and why that's not always obvious is when it's an older roof, as Ms. Miner pointed out, some of the problems with the roof are not always obvious, that you sometimes have to do some core sampling in the roof to get down past that top layer to see if you've had any moisture get into the, the insulation, if any of the wood underneath is damaged. Uh, so it's very difficult to give, you know, an upfront cost until you've started really analyzing and done some destructive testing in the roof. A new middle school, does it have a flat roof or a pitched roof? Uh, because that, good question for that one. We did talk about different kinds of roofs. If you remember in our discussion with the board, because we were talking about multiple stories, uh, the height regulation that the city has, uh, we had difficulty if you went above it, if you start doing a pitched roof, uh, because it was discussed. Matter of fact, we had to change some of the location of the air conditioning units and some of the, the cover for those units because we were getting up above the, the requirement. We had to get a special waiver just to do the, uh, the, the third roof, the third level. I'm just wondering, in the big scheme of things, if it's not um, worth going to the city for additional waivers, too. I don't know. I'm just... Now that I... That is actually why, when I brought the question up, <laughs> it was in reference to the middle school back in the spring, and, um, and um, I did get a response, too, yeah. And it was discussed, and of course, within the budget, uh, it would have it would have made it extremely tight. But the main reason was when we looked at the height and went up to that third floor, is just some of the problems that it would cause. And there are there are checks, you know, there are advantages to one over the other. It's not always that pitch roofs are always better. It's just there's there's different with the HVAC. All those things are. We have had a history of flat roofs here. <laughs> Although they're getting, I, I, when we say that one of the funny discussions is that very few that are truly flat. There is a slight pitch to it because they have to be angled and built up to drain into some of the, the roof drains. But I appreciate what you're saying. <coughs> Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. Since we have, have you here, maybe you can answer my question. Um, Ms. Ms. Berter referred to the Jamestown High HVAC replacement that is going to be spread, uh, spread across three years. Uh, what is involved in each year? I mean, what would what do what they hope to inc complete in a year's period of time? I'd have to come back with a little bit different report to go into any detail, but basically what they were saying is it, the volume of what you have to replace in a school that way has to be divided in parts. The first year, you really take a very hard look during the design of what's the best system to put into the building. 
uh, because you can guess, you can look at the range, but then you have to say, okay, we have three years, what's out on the market, what's the best thing for this school, and then you start to design, and that's when you determine exactly which pieces of the building you're going to tackle each year. And what, what would need replacing? Well, the entire system, and everything that has to You have to replace the, the ductwork and... Oh, yeah. In many cases, well, I shouldn't say that automatically. They look at it and they examine it first. If it's in good condition and it's sized correctly, they don't replace it. Uh, if it's too dirty, if it's been damaged, they have to investigate it. And we check that before they, during that design phase. Any other questions on the CIP? Or the, the beginning of this discussion, because we will have more discussion on this. Uh, no, this was great information. This was awesome. Thank you. So uh, th 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 thank you, Mrs. Berta and Mr. Robertson, and uh, for the committee for the good work that, uh, that they did as well. That brings us to 11.01, .01, board members' comments. There are comments from board members this evening? Always. Ms. Meyer. <laughs> um, Ms. Cook and I had an opportunity to visit Jamestown uh, High School this week, and I'd like to thank Dr. Worley and Mr. Bond and uh, Ms. Lassiter for their time. And we had lunch in the cafeteria, and I realize there's smoothie bars in our high schools now. Who knew? Um, but one of the interesting conversations that took place was around the school's need because there's a number of students in managing lunches. Um, and then we had a, a brief discussion about fields, and that's when uh, Ms. Cook learned for the first time that when we use Warner Field, um, that it's $300 per football game at Warner Field and $250 per each field hockey game and $300 for each soccer game and from the county. And, um, and I know that we have an ongoing um, agreement that we have had for many, many years with Park and Rec, and they have use of our gyms and our fields and, our, and we put lighting and we build sites so that they have access for all their great programs, which is a wonderful thing for the community. However, as we go into the contract and negotiations the next time, perhaps cost sharing might be something we need to, to talk about because we do have lights, incredible numbers of lights behind Matoka and Warhill and Blayton and Hornsby and Tuano and Stonehouse and yet I know that that is probably our electric bill, and it's probably, well, the grounds maintenance is shared now, but it's probably a, a cost, the cost sharing, and they do use our schools for a great before and after school program and a great summer camp program and for the basketball programs. We, just, just that we are recouping some of the costs for maintenance, repair, cleaning, oversight, all those kinds of things um, as we go forward since we're cost sharing as we should to maintain Warner Stadium, which is a wonderful facility as our school have use of. Thank you. It was a great visit, by the way. The kids were wonderful. We talked to a ninth grader who shared with us that he liked Berkeley's food better, so you'll just miss, Miss <laughs> Haley's not here to share that. Um, but he thought Berkeley did a better job with the lunch. But, <laughs> um, but he was delightful, and the students that we talked to were delightful. So. I just, <clears throat> I just wanted to thank all the speakers uh, that came uh, before us tonight. Uh, it's always really, really good to hear what the community has to say, and um, the equity issue is very important to me. The, um, the prison pipeline issue is very important to me, and I think it's important to uh, every school board member. And so I just wanted to say thank you for coming and uh, sharing your views with us tonight. Mrs. Young. Uh, I wanted to second that because one of the things I, I don't, um, I don't believe that any uh, organization or school intends to place students at a disadvantage. And I do think that's an ongoing conversation that we do need to have. So I do appreciate uh, the public's comments. It's certainly a concern of mine and I think all of the board members uh, share that concern. I also want to thank, um, the, the cabinet um, over the past months, as many of you know, I've met with many of you, I have developed a great appreciation for your role and uh, want you to know I support you. Um, however, that won't stop me asking questions and, and I hope I don't always sound like I'm, some of you are laughing, but that's good. <laughs> but I, I just hope you, you know how much I do appreciate you even though I, I sit here and my brain starts mulling and I, I just, I have lots of questions and I want what's best for our students and for our teachers. So thank you for your help and in helping me do my job. So I appreciate it. I, I get paid the big bucks to do this. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Beers. Uh, first of all, I would also like to congratulate 
um, all of the schools for being uh, fully accredited. Um, we're, we're sort of get used to that, um, but it's, uh, um, it is a challenge and, um, uh, and be able to say that all your schools are fully accredited is uh, uh, quite an achievement. Um, nevertheless, um, we know that there's work to do. Um, I, uh, in the past, have talked about uh, the achievement gap um, in, in this district, particularly in the middle schools. Um, and, um, and we will continue to, to focus on that. Um, it, is, it, it is good to hear members of the community um, um, voice their uh, support for that. Um, it, is a, it is a challenge. I, I, um, I, I went to a, a fabulous lecture uh, over at uh, William and Mary, and it was, on, it was totally on equity. Um, and I was the, and I was the, uh, I, and I asked the question: um, When you have a community um, that has a very affluent component um, and um, and a, a segment of the, of the population that is less affluent, um, and is also reflected in the um, makeup of the, st of the student body of various schools, um, how do you how do you try to achieve um, equity because it uh, it does come down to dollars um, and um, I know it's a challenge it will, co it will continue to be a challenge uh, but I you know I think I like to think that uh, we're looking far enough ahead that um, it's going to be it's going to worth the discussion and it's going to be worth the uh, you know the decisions um, that may um, uh, that may cost uh, in order to achieve that end but I um, I, I think it's very, uh, uh, very important. One other uh, thing that, um, I, and I sort of, I, I guess I would dovetail it onto the out of zone attendance uh, report. I know that uh, uh, the uh, central office has been working on. Uh, and I know we'll hear about that in the, in the future. Um, I would also like to have included in that, or along with that, um, I'd like to hear some uh, policy statements, information about uh, what oversight um, is carried out um, in terms of um, athletic teams, their uh, financial um, obligations or, and activities, all that sort of thing. Um, I, I know that there are lots of after school um, activities that, that, um, uh, that have various groups of people um, uh, providing financial support. Uh, but I, uh, I think ath athletics is a particularly um, unique area, and I, I would very much like to know um, what that what that <coughs> oversight is sometime in the future. Thank you, Ms. Good. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank the uh, city and the county for the September 9th uh, liaison <coughs> committee meeting, and thank you, Mrs. Young, for being there. It was a productive conversation that. Uh, f focus mostly on the CIP, which we heard a lot about tonight. So that was good. I think that uh, um, everyone's pleased with the progress and the cooperation. So thank you again, uh, uh, Ms. Berta, and to your committee. Um, I'd also like to uh, uh, respond to Ms. Mrs. Hummel's um, announcement earlier about the um, foundation, the application. Thank you for serving. Uh, you represent us well on that board, so thank you for doing that and for making that announcement, and to the foundation for their hard work uh, and to the teachers for their innovation. And um, so I, I'm excited. That's a very exciting time, so I can't wait to see what results. Um, and then again, congratulations on the accreditation. I agree with Dr. Beers that we sometimes get used to it, but I think that there's always um, opportunity for continuous improvement. improvement. And I, uh, I too appreciate the comments that we heard uh, from citizens tonight, and I've had the opportunity to speak about issues of uh, uh, equity with every single member of this board and, and know that everybody is, is uh, committed to that idea. I think when you talk about the prison to or the school to prison pipeline and and how poorly this state uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia does compared to other states I think it's important to understand that's an intersection of um, of state policy state uh, code 
um, and, uh, and, and then also what's happening on the ground in our schools. I think it's uh, important to understand that the, the General Assembly passed legislation that requires schools uh, to report incidences to law enforcement, and that puts everybody in a, in a difficult position, and I think in part explains why our state does so poorly in that area. Uh, it doesn't explain the disproportionality that we all see, um, and that needs to be worked on. And I think that the schools are working on it through our multi-tiered systems of support. And I'm excited to see how that work goes into implementation and to see um, how that uh, impacts our children in a positive way. Um, every child in our division, regardless of their uh, neighborhood, uh, their family status, um, or their home circumstances, has a, uh, a right to a quality education and to achieve to the best of their ability. And I know everybody up here believes that and is work gonna work towards policies to that end. So. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, board members, for your comments tonight. Uh, this was a, I think this was a really good meeting. Uh, appreciate all the public comments that we had. Uh, achievement gap is obviously something that uh, this board strives to, along with the administration, try, strives to uh, raise all students to the same level. Um, uh, comment earlier, too, about teaching staff and having the teaching staff look like our student body. Uh, that's something I've worked on with Dr. since Dr. Prater was on the board, um, and uh, trying to trying to achieve that balance of the teaching staff. Um, you know, the, the the school division is interest is and this community is there's there's a lot of dichotomy here, and I think this I think that uh, there will be several people who would be surprised to hear that uh, over 30 percent of the student body in Williamsburg James City County is on free and reduced lunch. Um, we kind of have that, have that reputation of being an affluent school division, but 30% uh, um, of our students uh, uh, are free and reduced lunch, and um, you know that's that's something that we need to come to grips with, and we need to understand as we set board policy and set and set um, the direction of our resources. There's a lot of uh, a lot of as we heard tonight, uh, just with the capital plan. There's a lot of a lot of demands on our resources. Our resources are limited. The plan that came from the committee is is uh, over a million dollars over the the planned budget with the county and the city, um, and so those are things that we need to work on and with things that we need to um, figure out with our funding partners how we're going to meet those challenges. Uh, one of the things that we did tonight uh, is approval of the middle school. We we have heard that our middle schools are crowded, um, that uh, the class sizes are uh, um, border, borderline unmanageable. Um, in some in some cases, uh, so uh, this construction of this middle school is an effort to resolve that issue and to and to address that. Uh, we were fortunate to have good uh, good good budget um, came back uh, within our, within our resources that we had budgeted. So I'm looking forward to uh, watching that project come together. Uh, Mrs. Hummel did mention about the. Uh, the management company, the engineering company that's going to, a construction management company that's going to uh, manage that construction for us on, with their boots on the ground. Um, you know, there's going to be some change orders, I am certain, but uh, I think they will still maintain uh, within our budget and within, and give us the, give us school system product that our schools, our students deserve, our students and our teachers deserve. So I'm um, looking forward to watching that come together. With that, 12.01 uh, upcoming events, policy committee meeting, once again, October 11th at 1.30 in um, uh, room 113 in the Stryker Center. Our upcoming meetings, uh, October 4th at 6 o'clock, closed session here in Building F. Uh, public hearing at 6.30 on the CIP on October 4th here in Building F, followed by a work session um, immediately following the public hearing. The board will be getting together on October 14th at 4.30 in room 309 of the Annex to discuss the RFP evaluation for the superintendent search. Um, is that a closed meeting, Mr. Chairman? That is not a closed meeting. Is it? The RFP evaluation. Is, is it a closed yeah, meeting? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a closed meeting. Uh, and then immediately following that, uh, we are right now planning to have a special call meeting to review the uh, school board standard operating procedures also in room 309 on October 14th. Uh, October 18th, closed session, 6 o'clock, uh, here at Building F, followed by a regular meeting at 6.30. Uh, 
also on October 18th here in Building F. So Special, uh, so we'll have to come out of the closed meeting for evaluation and go into an open meeting for yes, the SOP? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. SOP. Okay. Yep, that's correct. Um, so basically, we will earn our money in October. Um, with that, that objection, we are adjourned. <laughs>